Rule number one. Never carry anything you don't control. Welcome, Gothamites, to another episode of the Arkham Sessions. My name is Brian Ward. With me, as always, the psychologist to the superheroes, superheroines, and supervillains of Gotham City, and now a galaxy far, far away, Dr. Drea Letamendi. Hello, Drea. Hi, Brian. How are you? I'm good. I'm exhausted. I am the reason we have not posted an episode in the last few weeks, and I apologize for that to everyone. Um, as you know, Drea, for the last uh, couple of months, maybe since July, I've kind of had two full-time jobs. I'm, I'm doing something pretty exciting. How dare you? I know. How dare you work on exciting, creative stuff I know. that is supporting your mental and, yeah, uh, professional development. I mean, you, it's kind of cool what you're doing. I don't. Are you allowed to announce? Um, it yet? Maybe not. I will not say the name of the game, but I was approached by a, a good friend to um, to create some really cool featurettes for an upcoming video game that has been announced. It's it's coming out this year. It's going to be huge. Uh, but I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it, so I'm not going to yet, but, but stay tuned. I'll let you know when it's all available, but, but yeah, that has been, you you know, I've been coming home from my day job and immediately transitioning into my night job. And that has been, uh, pretty intense, uh, the last couple of months. So I apologize to the listeners. I promise it'll be worth it. Um, but we are now doing this episode and believe it or not, it is a surprise episode. If you read the title of the episode, you know what we're covering. We promised last time we would jump into the OG Star Wars. Um, that's not happening this, this, this time. (laughs) After the debate about what to call episode four, this is kind of fun. We did not really plan this. The timing worked out and or is now uh, up till episode four on Disney Plus. We've seen yeah. all four episodes and we're uh, prepped and ready to talk about the psychology of Andor, at least what we've seen so far in the first season. And we've just covered Rogue One. So if you haven't listened to the episode on Rogue One, it might be something to look into. There, mm-hmm. there may be some topics today that refer back to our last episode. But honestly, this is a prequel story to Rogue One. So I'm not even sure that it's that it applies really yet. that necessary to, to listen to that. Um, I do want to say, speaking of Star Wars, I'm super excited to finally be able to talk about the book that is actually now on pre-order on Amazon. That is a psychology textbook that I contributed to that includes a chapter written by me called The Force Awakens, Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy Using Star Wars. I'm super excited to be able to talk about it. Uh, You can just go to Amazon and look up Creative CBT with Youth. The book is called Creative CBT with Youth. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. You nailed it. Yeah, you nailed it. So this book is of a full, what I would call like an anthology of different methods and modes of using psychotherapy that lends itself to creativity, to using superheroes, fantasy, and improvisation. I've Imp- been working on that word. Improvisation. <laughs> improvisation yeah. In uh, therapeutic settings. So yes, the book is, uh, I'd say, primarily for practitioners and clinicians, but it's super fun. So you it, mean it's going to have a lot of big words? No, I mean, it's it's... I don't know that how practical it would be for somebody who isn't going to use it in a therapeutic setting. And by the way, my chapter is not for little kids. My chapter is for adolescents and teens and maybe even young adults mm-hmm. who are struggling with anxiety, depression, distress, really hard, intense emotional emotions, emotional experiences. And the way that mindfulness practices can be utilized in 
incredibly practical ways that refer to some of the themes in Star Wars. So it's basically how to teach people mindfulness using Star Wars. And we've got quite a few practitioners of mental health uh, sciences that listen to our show. Yeah. We, we actually get a, a significant number of people with various credentials uh, emailing us on a regular basis. I know they're out there. So they, they, <laughs> they might be they interested often, in this book. They often connect with us over Twitter and email and things. So for yeah, someone for someone I, who doesn't know, like for the lay person, what is cognitive behavioral therapy? Great question. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a type of psychotherapy, a type of talk therapy that allows a client or a patient to learn how to change their thoughts and behaviors in order to manage their mood, their distress, their intense feelings, their anxiety, and so forth. So it's a very kind of teachable and instructional directive very interactive type of therapy Mm. it's one of my favorite it's a very broad umbrella by the way so i mentioned that my chapter is about mindfulness yeah and mindfulness is a particular um strategy that i think a lot of people have heard of that can be used in different types of psychotherapies and in particular when you use mindfulness with cbt you're augmenting or enhancing the cognitive behavioral therapy with mindfulness practices. Right. Um, let me just say this too. When folks go to Amazon and look for this book, oh, by the way, um, the authors, the the editors rather of the book include Robert Friedberg and Erica Rosmid. And Love them. They, uh, actually, Bob is uh, an amazing mentor and has been in this CBT field for a long time. I That's don't know fantastic. I don't know if you're being sarcastic, but Bob... I, I've been. I was being the lay person who doesn't know who doesn't the name, know but you, but you know who they are. Um, Bob Friedberg. Uh, what? Uh, yeah. What a wonderful scholar, mentor, a practitioner. I've been so lucky to present with him like once or twice, and he invited me to write this chapter. So it's um, such an honor to be included with these scientist practitioners who put this comprehensive work together. What I was going to say for folks who look for this book. Uh, yes, practitioners and clinicians, I encourage you to purchase it on Amazon or f- directly from Springer. But for those of you who are just interested in my chapter and who are curious and maybe have um, some financial challenges purchasing the entire book, just email me. There might be ways, <clears throat> hint, hint, there might be ways to reduce those barriers yeah. so that you can have access to the different strategies and modalities that I'm talking about. I'll just, I'll just say that and leave it at that. That sounds awesome. Um, we've got, uh, we got an exciting message from someone, uh, using our speak pipe audio, uh, recording service. Actually, we've gotten quite a few. We're holding off on playing most of them until uh, we get to our 200th episode, which we hope will be uh, chock full of uh, your audience questions. Uh, and if you have some, I'm sure Drea will be happy to, uh, to to give you the information on how you can leave us a message as well. Um, but Drea, I know you were particularly excited uh, about this one. Absolutely. A listener... Michael Miller has sent a message to us. I just want to thank Michael for their message. We're going to play it right now. And it's just a very appreciative mention of what the podcast does. Hello. I just listened to the Rogue One episode, which was very interesting. And I wanted to comment on what Dr. Drea said about um, the pushback to um, bringing the sort of education about science and psychology is strictly into the classroom setting and i think what you're doing is important because not everyone ends up in a college classroom not everyone um, can learn about science in that particular setting Um, you're doing the work of meeting people where they are of fitting in uh, an hour here and there into their busy lives so that people who have moved past the college classroom um, can learn. People who would never end up in a college classroom can learn. Um, And I think you're doing important work, and I appreciate you for it. 
Um, thanks. Bye. That's very nice. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. I, and yeah, very important. Super uh, important. You you are often uh, hit with pushback from from colleagues, not necessarily people that you directly work with, but I mean, like just colleagues in your industry who don't understand, you know. I wouldn't say they don't understand. I'd say it's a much different pathway in that I, I wouldn't say everything that I learn, teach, study, train on is is put into the podcast, but I try my best to yeah. bring the most recent, most accurate, and most relevant psychological science to the Arkham sessions. And I appreciate, I don't know if Michael is uh, a scientist or practitioner, but I or both, but I appreciate Michael's mention of the reason that we do this show. It really is to improve awareness, to reduce stigma, and to increase education around psychological science. So and if, thanks for that. If our listeners want to leave a message similar to Michael's or even uh, a question about any of the topics that we've covered in the past over the last 190 some odd episodes, or you've got uh, suggestions or topics you want us to cover uh, in the upcoming episodes, where can they go to leave such a message? I'd be so excited to hear from people. I'm starting to listen to some of the messages messages that were submitted and so far they're so great you can go directly to speakpipe.com forward slash the arkham sessions again speakpipe.com forward slash the arkham sessions and just press that orange button and start recording i think it cuts off at about a couple minutes um so keep it brief uh keep it pg-13 and uh wow we could go all the way to yeah, pg-13 nice this the show can yeah, can be, our audience can handle it. Yeah, I think so. Okay. And, um, you know, by the way, if you don't want your message to be played, but you want to um, tell us something privately, you can just say at the beginning of the message, yeah. um, please don't play this on the show. Yeah. Uh, if you can't remember or or can't write down the address, you can also just go directly to my website, drdreapsychology.com, and the button's right there. Awesome. We need to talk about Andor. Uh, we've got a, a limited opportunity to talk today, uh, but we wanted to get this episode out. So let's talk about these four episodes. First um, impressions. Let's start there. Okay. So I'm personally really, really enjoying the show. It's a slow burn. It is, uh, it is not the adventure packed, uh, uh, series that, you would think Star Wars would be, you know, every every episode of Star Wars and every movie of Star Wars is just uh, explosions and lasers and swords and you know all that. And this a is a lot of it, what I say: hooting and hooting and hollering, hooting and hollering. <laughs> this is uh, a slow burn, and it's it's it feels like it's come from the mind of a soldier. Like it's yeah. it's. Uh, the kind of story where you're not necessarily looking to get into fights. So you don't have all the fights all the time. So you are, you are, uh, it, it's that struggle. I enjoy Diego Luna's character. I enjoy the other characters we're being introduced to. Admittedly, I'm going to let you do a lot of the heavy lifting today because I don't have a lot to talk about. It, because I find that so many of the characters are sticking really close to the vest. They are, they are secretive. Uh, I mean, even by the point that we have reached, Cassian Andor's character isn't even using his own name anymore for the right. you know for the foreseeable future. So, so everybody is secretive. I don't necessarily get a read on everyone just yet, uh, but I'm fascinated to know what you think of these four episodes. Uh, and of course, this is a 12 episode series, so you know we're a third of the way through. Yeah, and uh, it, this and could it's, be. It's interesting. A lot has happened, but not. Not a lot has happened. Yeah. Just in terms of... It's been all very personal. Yeah, like deep deepening this bigger... It, it's interesting. There's a, there's a big world. We're vaguely familiar with this era. This is, of course, after the Galactic Republic is overtaken, overthrown by yeah. the Galactic Empire. And now the Imperial... Uh, authoritative government is taking over the universe. Yeah. So this is all of the and and, and for people that didn't know, this is five years prior to Rogue One. Okay. So 
so there's a little bit of time leading up. Uh, this is sort of the the beginnings of the rebellion. The uh, I, I guess the technically the rebellion began the moment right. the, the moment the republic fell. But uh, I, I think there's a lot of comparisons to many historical places and countries where it is this several decades long yeah. development yeah. of a very dangerous um potentially um world changing universe changing in this case set of powers or yeah. power in this case and despite that bigger world we're really focused on this individual person cassie nandor who we know from rogue one right who we're familiar with but what i like about this star wars story is that it's a Star Wars story that isn't going to have the lasers and the force and some of those fantastical things that we know exist in the universe, but simply are not going to be foregrounded and yeah. utilized here. So yeah. it, you know, people have said this is a grittier Star Wars. It's well, okay. So I want to ask you about that. You you seem to like it based on your your response here, but we know that online there are people who love the series, and then uh, there are people who don't like the series. Uh, we have a very dear friend. I will not name them here, but uh, they really think the the show is extremely well written it's extremely well produced beautifully shot beautifully acted but to their opinion this is not star wars yeah. because to them star wars should be something that should be uh, accessible to all members of the family uh, you should be able to show a seven or eight year old uh, right, like the the the. Um, it should be fun and so like swashbuckling. The, the Star Wars, yeah, that Star Wars is a genre. Yes. Of adventure. Yes. And fun. And it's space some, pirates and yes, wizards and, and some yeah. risk, but not not too much of yeah. sort of this darker, grittier. Meanwhile, world. we are currently watching the genuine underbelly of war. Yeah. Uh, you know the the people who do the things you don't want to hear about. Uh, that we were kind of introduced to when we talked about in Rogue One, where yeah. Cassian comes right out and says, all the people that are joining you in your your struggle right now are all the people who need to believe that the crap that we've done, all the horrible things we have done, have been worthwhile. And now we're getting to see his introduction to that lifestyle. Because when we're introduced to Cassian uh, in this series... He is not that character yet. He is not the spy. He is not. He is just basically a petty thief uh, who has gotten his hands on something more valuable than he's ever gotten his hands on before. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a piece of imperial property that uh, he needs to unload quickly yeah, and is, for a lot of money. He's savvy. He's smart. He knows how to move through uh, these towns, these different areas of the universe and in this case the it, we're really limited to a couple of planets but he's able to navigate the the and i actually love this part about andor as a series mm -hmm. this is a character who's navigating the different classes of society and knowing kind of how to move through and survive and even succeed in some ways to to get what he wants and i don't mean that in a selfish way i sort of mean it in a way to, to have some um personhood to have some meaning to have um some level of impact mm -hmm. at, at this stage not in a very big way because that's about to happen when he's recruited to the alliance uh but in a way that just makes him sort of feel like he has some sense of reason purpose belonging it's yeah up to, up to this yet. point yeah. yeah up to this point it's all been it's sort of how how can i get by how yeah. can someone like me survive get by and and he has well, now we're really getting into it when we're introduced to him we know he has somewhat of a friendship circle he has a home he has a very um charismatic and loyal droid that he's connected to so he's not so he's not a he's not like a lone i want to say lone gunman right lone wolf he is yeah he's not that 
at this time. He's picked up by Marva and Clem, and uh, they are going around, I guess, trying to salvage what they can from what appears to be an Imperial ship that's crash landed on a planet with a uh, an indigenous group of of kids. I mean, we're we're looking at kids, right? Uh, for the most part, for the this, yeah, like the, I, I didn't really yeah. see a whole lot of adults in no, this scene. <laughs> and it's a good opportunity for us to talk a little bit about the Canari people. We are learning through the reports and descriptions of others, the more familiar folks to us. We aren't really learning directly from the Canari people because when they talk, we don't get those subtitles. They're speaking in a in a language yeah. that isn't given to us, isn't translated to us through yeah. subtitles. So it's a... We are as alien to yes. them as they to us. Yeah. It is a... And I don't know that I'd use that word, but it is... They are depicted as a remote, indigenous, unconnected, uncolonized community of yeah. peoples. And you're right. The, the, the young adults and teens are the ones who are... Going out and foraging, going out and hunting, going out and yeah. discovering what is happening. I'm picking up some... like Thunderdome vibes, yeah, it's, right? It's, it's just a bunch unique. of kids that are hanging out together. Uh, and having having said that, there are elements of this indigenous community that I honestly cannot wait for the behind the scenes on this series on Andor. You know how Disney Plus does those documentaries or whatever yeah. and they're kind of telling you what inspired the different mm -hmm. i live for all of those series yeah. you don't I, I i cannot wait to hear because what and i haven't seen yet an article that covers this and if folks see one or have one please send it my way the different elements the artifacts the dress the makeup the the uh, war paint that we see amongst these native individuals this is all these all these elements come from Central and South American indigenous communities. And in fact, let's let's just start with a couple of these because this is a bit of a tangent from our show. But you'll notice the blowguns. Yeah. You know what blowguns are, right? Sure. So the this is a weapon also called a blowpipe or a blow tube. And it's this uh, it's this handmade tube, a ranged weapon, and they they make the darts and they they simply it's a projectile they they blow into it and um and the pipe sends the the dart to usually an animal sometimes uh, uh any kind of threat right mm -hmm. and a lot of cultures have blow blow guns or blow darts but what i'm noticing is that in combination with some of the other elements that we see with this community, I wonder if they're trying to pick up on South American and Central American weapons or, or very early, early uncolonized indigenous weapons. Right. Uh, that stood out for me. I can't wait to hear from the writers and developers why they chose this. And by the way, the writer, the, the showrunner for this is Tony Gilroy. If you're familiar with that name at all, uh, he basically wrote the scripts for the Born series the board franchise so you're getting a lot of that same sort of spy uh spy adventure element out of andor um but he is also one of the co-writers of of rogue one so you know few people would know cassian's character better and how to get to the character we meet like in rogue one right and and i can't again you're getting some of the story here that he as a young child was raised amongst this uh, indigenous community. Until he was taken. Yeah, so he is, you know. He, he has family, he has a sister we know of. Uh, and has, we, we've met her in the flashbacks. Her, right. And he is currently in present day looking for her. I guess the question is why show that? Why even bother with this native community that we know actually gets wiped out in some way? by mm -hmm. the Imperials. Mm -hmm. So he's not going to get reunited with them. And I'm thinking that a lot of this has to do with how his early life is shaped, who he calls family, uh, what early childhood stressors and adversity he might have experienced, but certainly that element of being an outsider, kind of like that insider-outsider identity is 
paramount to how he's moving through society today as we see him. I don't know how old he was. Maybe it's in the wiki. He's probably, would you say like 12 when he's picked up by Marva? Yeah, somewhere in there. So he's he's never seen droids. He's never looked in a mirror. Like he, there are all these things that are absolutely unfamiliar to him. And he looks, he sees his reflection and immediately starts destroying yeah. the objects in which he can, not in a terrified, uh, that's a thing that's not me, but it, you almost see the moment of recognition. And then that's, that like creates something in him that uh, he then just starts destroying the inside of the ship. I'm not even sure that they've seen ships before. Yeah, I mean, they see right? this thing flying out of the, flying in yeah. the sky and crash landing, and they all go to, or a few of them go to explore it. He goes inside. What do you think about the fact that she drugs him and kidnaps him and takes him to her home? Well, and that's interesting because now you're you're also looking at it from Clem's perspective because Clem, her husband, is like, uh, "What are you doing?" why are you taking this kid? And she keeps saying, I'm not going to leave him to die because basically if he stays on the ship, the Imperials that get there, they're going to, they're going to kill him. They're going to, you know, kill everyone yeah. there, uh, you know, uh, presumably. So she comes right out and, you know, in her opinion, she is saving his life. Um, but she is taking on essentially a child mm -hmm. and uh, then going to raise him in her ways, which seem to be a little on the, um, I wouldn't say devious, but a little on the unscrupulous. She is, uh, she's all about secrets and, uh, keeping things from authorities. And, uh, yeah. you know, she's, she's essentially raised, going to raise him to be a thief. And, uh, it seems as though the outcome outweighs the action, the behavior to drug and kidnap this kid, this minor. We should say when you say drug and kidnap, like we're not talking about this isn't Dahmer. This isn't like a, someone, you know, <laughs> giving him a roofie. I mean, she she quickly sort of knocks him out and and takes him. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's more it, of a medical. Right. <laughs> Right, she sedates him and takes him. Sure, yeah. sure, okay. She's not like, here, kid, drink this. Yeah, I mean, but he's scared, he's unwilling. Yeah. He's completely traumatized. Uh, by the way, the um, the community leader, the older female teen mm -hmm. of the Canari people who is seen as the one who makes the decisions, the one who people look up to, she's almost a matriarch. Uh, of of this community she's attacked so and i believe she dies in that in that scene where they're checking out what who are who's on these ships why are these ships here right so this kid is potentially in shock he's traumatized he doesn't know what's going on i i think that her that marva's intentions are probably good and yet what we see in him I think what I'm saying from a parenting developmental perspective is that what we see in him could be influenced by her pattern, her personality. Yeah, the, oh, the for sure. Well, he's we, we see early on that he wants nothing more than to fit in. He wants to belong even with right. his own Canari people. You, you see that uh, he starts to mimic the the girl who puts the war paint on he starts to do it in the exact same way she is like he he is mimicking and, and trying to fit in so you get the sense that that this isn't necessarily even in his own world he's still looking to find his place in his own personality of course and so i think he's going to do the same thing with marva and Clem, he is going to do what he can to, um, 
I don't want to say assimilate necessarily, but I, I think we are looking at a character who has never quite found himself. He has never found his own purpose. He's always been sort of trying to be what those around him were. Mm-hmm. And I think ultimately that's where Rogue One comes in, right? It's like, sure, it's him sure. finally realizing. And I totally agree with you. Yeah. And I'd say that the element of cultural identity is to me very salient here. We've had other discussions about Star Wars and cultural identity. Here, I think what you said really resonates for me, that he, his original community was essentially wiped out. He's, he's displaced, he's, he's relocated, he's, he's taken into a new culture. And so he struggles to find his belongingness, his sense of purpose, how he can be a part of this community, but there are barriers there. He's, uh, he's, he's not exactly economically resourced. The town that he's in, at least when, when we're really first introduced to him is like this mining town, right? A, mm-hmm. a somewhat modest kind of factory Looks like Galaxy's resource. Edge. Yeah. What's that? It looks like Batu to, right, de- to some degree. Right. Um, so it doesn't have the polish and the uh, ostentatious way of life that like the Imperial, you know, the senators, the Coruscant mm-hmm. uh, would be. Mm-hmm. So we know off the bat that he's of lower class and we know off the bat that he is essentially a sort of a refugee and that he's struggling to find his purpose but i think what you said is right like spot on he's he's both talented and skillful at moving in between boundaries and cultures and also is somewhat of an outsider Mm -hmm. that's why i said sort of like an outsider and insider both and uh and this is a strength of his he is really skillful Right. moving around but he's also we see him i mean would you say he's a happy person no no i mean how would you describe his his emotional state driven i mean he is he is focused on a singular sort of mission um, and not letting anything else get in his way emotionally so he's he's not allowing himself to be happy around those he would consider friends to him they are more allies they are people who can get things for him so he he sees them as um like mechanisms yeah, for other things yeah, yeah. utilitarian mm. i worry for him so when we're introduced to him in the first episode and i'm i'm wondering if you can walk us through the pivotal cataclysmic thing that happens that leads into kind of like a criminal lifestyle. We already know that he is, he's a thief, he's duplicitous, he's likely breaking a lot of laws, breaking a lot of rules, but he's not a murderer at the time that we meet him. He's kind of in the blur, he's in the gray, he's in the shadow. I mean, uh, we don't know. Uh, we, we don't know, I mean... So the thing that that I think is interesting about that that first scene where he comes across two basically off-duty police officers uh-huh. in a brothel. Yeah. And they are bullying him and they're about to shake him down to get money from him. Uh, he fights back. He's clearly, he shows off that he's trained um, and is able to to take one of them down. What he doesn't realize is that when the guy hits the ground, he... He's he, killed. He's he, killed. He strikes his head and it creates trauma. Yeah. The guy, the guy is killed. The other guy notices this, uh, realizes he's unarmed. Cassian has the pistol and uh, he begins to cry and beg for his life. And by the way, this is one of the key moments that kept our friend from enjoying this as Star Wars. The guy is crying, begging for his life, and he is basically trying to plead with him uh, to find a, a way out of the situation, and Cassian simply pulls the trigger, presumably shoots the guy in the face, 
point blank range. You don't actually see it on screen. You do not see it in the it's screen. Heavily implied. But you see Cassian. You you see Cassian as he pulls the trigger, uh, and there's right. little emotion on his face. Now Cassian realizes he is messed up. He sure. flees the the scene. Uh, does everything he can to sort of erase the tracks behind him. Uh, unfortunately, he is uh, sort of, uh, I guess they describe him as a Canari because he slipped up and said that he was looking for a Canari girl, was looking for his sister. Uh, and then the, the, the brothel, folk the. Are not yeah. of the majority society. Yeah. Yeah. To say that you are. Canari, or that you're looking for a Canari person. At some point, they even describe his appearance. There's right. a, some association that this is an ethnic minority person, right? And that identifies him because right. apparently he's told Marva. He's told somebody. Well, she knows. She right? knows. So um, rather, but she says, "Who else have you yes. told?" You know, we were always supposed to keep this a secret. And he's like, well, you've told people. And she's like, all the people I've told are dead at this point. Uh, You know, there's no there's no safety issue there. Mm -hmm. But but who do you trust? Who are you going around telling? Um, But the reason I say we don't know is we then find out in episode four that he was actually in the war when he was 16. So, so he, he was part of a faction of people who were fighting against another faction of people. And they both found out that they were kind of fighting each other. So the, the empire had them killing each other off. Uh, And this is a strategic thing that the empire was doing. Let's put a pin in that. I sort of want to return. I understand. But what I'm saying is he knows what it is. Like he's not an untrained, has not killed anybody. Here's, Here's what I would say. And it's unclear. My understanding, he just might not be a murderer. My understa- right. My understanding of this moment yeah. is that this is the first time he's killed someone when it was not in self-defense. I'll go with you there. Right? Like, I'll, yeah, I'll, he I'll may accept have that. shot a pistol at somebody or or may have um, injured Even killed somebody. Someone. Right. Like, I, I think he's definitely been involved with violence. Yes. This is the first time that he's driven and and, I guess... The, the word I'm looking for is makes the decision to intentionally end someone's life when he's not literally in the moment and in danger of losing his life. And it's just going to get worse because yeah. if, if you remember when we meet him in Rogue One, the very first thing he does is kill. He murders one of his own colleagues because he's injured and can't go with you oh, can't no, escape now with it's like him. just a, a total that's then, what i'm saying is you're now yeah. if that's the if that is literally the first time he's ever done it he becomes whatever quite happens in this series <laughs> is just going to make it worse i so so my he's going to feel like it it's validated yeah like my understanding yeah. here in honestly my training and experience with targeted violence is that the, that sounded like Wait, let me back up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you got an experience in targeted violence? My study of targeted violence, not my firsthand experience of targeted violence. I guess the two things I want to say is that to me, it seems as though the story uh, spotlights this moment to let us know this is a turning point for him. Yeah. This is kill to kill. Yeah. This is this is different than anything before. Uh, well, it's not kill to kill. It is kill to, to some degree it is, but it's also kill to protect. It's kill to cover. So let's unpack that a little bit, yeah. right? There's, there's two types or two modes of violence generally. Right. When I'm talking about human to human, when somebody um, is driven to, uh, to targeted violence. So yeah. this is not accidental. There's effective violence, not effective with an E, effective with an A. Yeah. That is when, that is likely the majority of people who are killing others in combat, in self-defense, or are in a situation where they feel very threatened. Mm -hmm. So effective violence is a very emotional kind of targeted violence it's when you are likely in that self-defense mode. And it's very emotional. Usually uh, someone is driven to the point where they feel like they have to do it. The other type of violence is instrumental violence. 
And this is the kind of violence where someone is planful. They are calm. Uh, the, the folks that study these modes of violence uh, highlight the fact that people who engage in instrumental violence, those are folks that can show extreme balance, mental balance, calmness, just a sense of premeditated targeted violence. And it makes them quite good at killing other people. Okay. And my understanding, because of his expression, because of the panic he's in, because of the the situation where he knows this officer. I mean, let's be real. The person pleading for his life may turn him in still. Oh, he's definitely going to turn yeah. him in. He's negotiating his way out, yes. Of the situation. That's why I'm saying I think this is his affective right this is yes. this is he yeah. he needs to do this because there's no way out he's exactly i think he's emotionally yeah uh uh on fire hot right. hot right. right like right. has no other choice the the little bit of executive functioning that's going the little bit of rationality is telling him this dude's going to rat me out this dude's seen my face yeah i've got to kill him but 90 percent of this is this emotional intensity that drives his behavior. Uh, the reason I bring this up is that this is kind of a turning point for him where later we know that he's going to engage in some targeted violence, potentially uh, ones that in- in- lead to mass casualty events. He is in those situations more planful, more balanced, more calm, it, it it is a very different kind of situation, and I think that's why this scene is provided to us in this way. Almost like that idea that he um, he crosses a line here. Interesting. So so in if I'm interpreting what you're saying correctly, uh, affective killing would be uh, emotional. Uh, well. It, 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 really, it's the, you said the other one is instrumental? It's called instrumental violence. It's also called predatory violence. Okay, but even if things get bad, like if this becomes easier for him, so he kills the dude in Rogue One, I, I still feel like it puts him in that category of affective killing where like yes it's easier for me i'm not really gonna get real emotional about it but there's really only way out of this situation you're injured uh you're going to put me in jeopardy you're going to put the mission in jeopardy i'm going to have to you know the the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one i'm going to go ahead and kill you you know whatever whereas a serial killer would be instrumental yeah you know and and one could say that Cassian displays the lack of emotional, you know, quality to, you know, that he could very well be a serial killer. Uh, It's just easy for him. But I think that's his soldier. That's the that's the covert operative, you know, soldier in him that's thinking about the mission, thinking about the the war, thinking about the need for the alliance to win uh, against the the evil empire. So I would not say that he's necessarily crossed a line unless it's the line where he is now compartmentalizing those emotions. So like he's not going to let them get in the way, but he clearly still has them because in Rogue One, uh, he even is like, look, I'm he's like, look, I've done horrible things. I know I've done horrible things. I am cognizant of all that. So I, I feel like he's still in that other category. Are you saying that he's crossing the line to the other one? I'm not saying that somebody has the capacity for just one or the other. I am saying that his experience with that officer somehow built his repertoire, his capacity to engage in certain kinds of violence. And I actually agree with you. In some ways, he gets better. And by the way, I'm not saying that instrumental violence is always bad Mm. there's reasons back uh we are very equipped for this when we were hunter gatherers we needed to be low to the ground you know uh army crawling 
uh, we we are built as humans to yeah. pounce on yeah. uh, prey, right? So so this is a in many ways um, a natural part of our humanness. Having said that, when people are able to to harness that in the way that he does, it can go in many directions. It can go toward um, gaining notoriety, toward gaining power and dominance, toward manipulating others. This is the direction of the serial killer. This is what you brought up. Although it depends on the serial killer. This is going to be a completely different podcast. But um, like, <laughs> Tune in uh, next month. Yeah, as we... Like a, a, a Dahmer would have actually both kinds. Both kinds, affective sure. and instrumental, and some um, some are more just very robotic uh, about. So Darth Vader, that. Darth Vader, instrumental because he doesn't even need he's to kill. Well, but he doesn't need to kill. Like he he could literally take you down any number of ways without actually killing you. But he decides to be brutal. So I would say, and, and he's not fighting yeah, for I'd a cause. Say, I'd say he's, you're right. You know, the empires, they're the ones in charge. He's not fighting for the cause of defeating the the. I would say separatists. he does it for power. Yeah. Okay, so I'm trying to eliminate, even though we're talking about murder, I'm trying to eliminate the sense of like, it's always bad or it's always good. Yeah. Because some folks who are uh, in combat situations are incredibly calm. Yeah. Uh, very strategic, very intentional, uh, and yet have to do some pretty serious things, right? right? But going back to Andor, I think my main point here is that when we see his, like the intensity of his reaction after the first guy dies from the blow, we're seeing him act in a certain way. He panics. Yeah, I think it's driven by by emotions. But I think that's also, as I said, maybe the the turning point for him or or the reality the realization that he uh notices he can do this and mm-hmm. he can be successful and he's actually good at it mm-hmm. so he becomes a better fighter a better soldier and, and yes a better assassin we haven't yet seen this yet in in the show but we are seeing in episode four that somebody recognizes his capacity for violence and recruits him into this uh this little alliance faction yeah uh what else are you picking up on cassian during these four episodes like what when you watch this because for me for me i find his character interesting but i'm not ready necessarily like i'm not picking up on a a ton of qualities to talk about but i'm i see you over there like you're writing notes feverishly what else have you picked up on with this particular character there are probably two additional themes that make me notice cassian andor as separate or as uniquely interesting i guess compared to some of the other characters we've seen in in star wars who've struggled with some similar ideas belongingness who am i how do i fit in the universe Mm -hmm. um the one thing that's cool about andor is that He's not really asking, like, where am I from? You know, a lot of it is like, where am I really from? Uh, I struggle, like, how how do I fit in in this bigger universe? Who's my daddy? You know, like, all these, like, themes that in Star Wars are so relevant. We have the sister theme. I'm looking for my sister. Yeah. However, this is somebody who was old enough to know where his origins are. He he knows he's Canari. He knows who his original family is. I think that his sense of self is intact in that way or is a part of him, is a known part of him in that way. That is not his search. Right. But I do think kind of circling back to our understanding of his psychology and, and his mental state, the guy who who picks him up, Luthen. Uh, Luthen, played by a scars guard. Yeah, because these days you can't roll cameras on anything that's going to hit the silver screen or small screen like, without a yeah. scars guard in it. Looks like one in five or one. This in is six. Daddy Scars Guard. He's the OG. He's <laughs> so he he notices these abilities and strengths, and he's going to recruit him for this particular mission. Mm-hmm. 
two things about this. One is that Cassian is in a mental state that is vulnerable to something like this. So going back to, I think, what you said when I asked you, like, do you think he's happy? He is, he's not angry. Right. He's not like a, he's not in a space mentally where he's going to, you know, bomb yeah. uh, uh, the uh, institutional yeah. uh, places, right? He is, but he is somewhat in this state of depression and despair. There's some parts of him we're noticing where he he isn't exactly experiencing quality of life psychologically, emotionally. Right. Well, he's dis- he feels disillusioned. Yeah. He he realizes that because he once fought and then once they figured out that he, so he doesn't really know he knows he hates the empire but he doesn't know who to join to go up against them so he he'd is, rather exactly. unlike Luke Skywalker who feels a pull toward greatness and or just wants to stay undercover and uh and ultimately find his sister like his own his own his really is his own mission is just finding her it's not like i don't really care about your rebellion i don't really care what faction you are like right. yeah the empire's bad but we can't do anything about it he's uh, at this point he is uh he he just he's not involved yeah and i you know i totally agree with that i'd also say that even though he believes his sister is out there somewhere there is a bit, there's a part of him that has this nothing to lose mentality. Yeah. That he might be willing to engage in some pretty serious, almost suicidal right. missions or behaviors uh, if it means something. Yeah. And that is critical. That's a very well, and in this case, place to be. When he's recruited, though, it means money. Like the money, the money is giving him an opportunity because he's being offered 200,000 credits to, to do this mission that's going to take five days. And it, so he's basically becoming a mercenary at that mm. point. It doesn't mean anything to him emotionally. He really doesn't care about the cause. At this point, he needs the money because it's going to help him further his own, his own personal Right. Goal. Which, by the way, I'm curious about. That's That, to me, is a, is a part of the story we've not really gotten yet, and I want to know. When we're introduced to him, he's looking for this girl that's his sister. Um, did he just find out she was alive? Or has he always known and over the years, like, in other words, was he brought up the way he was kind of forgetting Canari? Until he learned that his sister might still be alive right. and that's what set him off on this path? Or has he been doing this since he was a child, picking up little bits of information along the way until now he, he knows she was at this brothel at one point. This is what mm-hmm. she looks like. This is who she is, you know. Uh, so I'm curious about that. I want to know if this has been a personal mission since the day he was taken or if this is a very recent thing. Aside from the connection to her and the potential for rebuilding yeah. that, that family, exactly because that that's because that's he doesn't have much else. Exactly, and that's sort of the difference between the two versions of his character. Right? Is there's the character who hasn't really cared until the moment he found out he might have a connection, or there's that character that always cared about finding his family, about finding his original. You know, well, where what he if came it's more from. more nuanced and it is both present, both, that there are times in his life when the disillusionment, the despair, the, again, feeling like there's nothing to lose, nothing to live for. Right. With, at times, moments where maybe there is a meaningful connection out there. Maybe I can find her. Maybe there's ways that I can help her or that she could help me. Yeah. So I don't know that it has to be that perfectly all or nothing, this or that. But I will say that in addition to this critical time that he's recruited, there are these important discussions between him and Luthen about 
how to how to essentially dismantle the empire or maybe not even dismantle hurt but it. hurt the empire yeah which is a very emotional thing here because Th- yeah there's been no promise to take them down right. there's only the promise to cripple them in some he way he makes these comments you know at one point mm-hmm. he says uh Luthen says wouldn't you rather spit in their food than just steal their little trinkets uh don't you want to really make them hurt yeah yeah um and it seems like either this is psychological manipulation, like he really knows he can get to Cassian if yeah. he says it this way, or maybe he believes this himself, that there are ways that when we're both in and out of the Empire, essentially, when we, if you can be as mutable, if you can be as strategic and move through social class, if, you're, if your mobility as a spy or as a mercenary or as a nobody or as an invisible person. I don't mean that I don't mean that as a yes. as a force wielder. <clears throat> I mean that as a, as a savvy, you know, individual that Cassian is. Maybe you can really impact the empire in a way that makes you feel better about it. And by the way, not that we're going to get into this uh just now, but we see that Luthen is exactly what you're describing. We I see, love it so much. Yeah, I'm like all like for he this. he suddenly adapts in a way like he he is exactly what you're talking about and he sees the potential for Andor to be the same way. I wonder Brian if you can play that exchange. It's it's mostly Cassian explaining to Luthen how he's been able to engage in this thievery, how he's stolen this hugely important imperial, what is it, some kind of... Uh, some a, piece of the ship. Yeah, it's an important piece of the ship, some tracking device. And he tells Luthen he ju- that, that Cassian just walks in. And Luthen's like, how do you do that? Um, so I wonder if you can play that little exchange. Sure thing, got it right here. Here, take a listen now. I know Big Sass are gay. I know you bribe quartermasters to leave valuables on the ships before they come in for scrap, but this isn't that. This isn't something that let pass. No. I went in and got this myself. How? How's that possible? It was it was sealed on the Imperial Naval Base in Steergard. Look, you got the money, I got the box. What else is there to talk about? I'll give you another thousand credits to tell me how you got it. <laughs> another thousand. Done. How? You just walk in like you belong? Takes more than that, doesn't it? What? To steal from the Empire? What do you need? A uniform, some dirty hands, and an Imperial toolkit? (laughs) They're so proud of themselves, they don't even care. They're so fat and satisfied, they can't imagine it. Can't imagine what? That someone like me would ever get inside their house, walk their floors, spit in their food, take their gear. The arrogance is remarkable, isn't it? They don't even think about us. Boss, I don't know you. So he's talking about the pride of the Empire. It's so fascinating, and it's so true. This sense that if you are so invisible in society, one, it, you, you are actually are not noticed in some ways by the higher classes. But the other thing here that I think is what you're talking about is the level of arrogance, the self-centeredness, the blindness of the upper classes. Yeah. That if you, and, and Luthen has practiced this, if you talk like me and dress like me and are like me, if you're actually, if you're in my space, I'm assuming you're like me. Yeah. I mean, historically, a lot of the best known spies of like say the revolutionary war uh, mm-hmm. and even the civil war were servants of generals or uh, higher powered folk who, uh, who would then just come back and report because it doesn't matter if you're in the room, like they're not going to pay attention to you yeah. anyway. Yeah. So, uh, Fantastic. you know, so yeah, it's, it's just like really, really, I think just these, these exchanges are and Cassian's important. basically saying, even if they do see me, there's no way I would have the gall to take something 
because that's just unheard of. And he's like, meanwhile, I'm, I just, I just take things. I yeah. dip my hand in, take whatever I can get a hold of. And in this particular case, he got a hold of something really, really important. Yeah, this is, I think, for me, the most interesting. <clears throat> the quest for the sister interests me, but this, this, uh, these comments, the discourse on social mobility, and the this is reminding me of Rogue One. The fact that this show has the balls to say some of these things about its own society yeah and and star wars from day one has been about the the people in power and the people who are disenfranchised and marginalized and under-resourced and each time there's a star wars and i'm not saying i don't like the fantasy the adventure the lightsabers i love all of that but when you remove that you really are focused and and really um having no choice but to face these kinds of themes that I believe have been in Star Wars from from the get-go, from the yeah. jump, yeah. from the hyper jump. Yeah. Yeah, it was a it, just sort of a comment that I had made to our friend, just this idea of, you know, the, the word war is in the title and war ultimately is hell. Uh, it, it's not necessarily meant to be fun and and thrilling and exciting uh, every single time. There are people doing heinous things whether you know it or not and meanwhile most of star wars that we've known has all been through these sort of rose-colored glasses of a little blonde farm boy who was made for greatness and you know i i'm very interested in exploring this war from the perspective of those other people who are never going to be known um you know, in the annals of the new Republic. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I just don't, uh, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm very interested in this story and, uh, I enjoy it very much. Next time, Dre and I are going to jump back right back into where we were supposed to go. Uh, this week we are going to go right back into star Wars, but Brian, what about the rest of Andor? We're going to cover that too, but, the remaining episodes uh, probably bundled each time, similar to this one, where we'll cover three or four episodes uh, each each time. Uh, those will be available exclusively over at Patreon. Um, there is a, uh, a tier over there for people who want to hear our coverage of uh, Batman Beyond, which uh, we've done a handful of episodes of. Join that tier, and you're now going to get the remaining analyses of uh, Andor. And um, we're, we're looking forward to that. Uh, Till next time, Drea, why don't you tell the good folks where they can find you online? You can find me on my website, drdreapsychology.com or on social media at Arkham Asylum Doc. You can find me on Twitter at bward028 or uh, on Instagram at b underscore ward028. You can find us both on Twitter at Arkham Sessions or on Instagram at the Arkham Sessions. You can also email us at uh, the at Arkham Sessions at gmail.com. Uh, you come follow us on Facebook and, uh, like I said, come to patreon.com forward slash the Arkham sessions and you, uh, can have your name called out just like these folks, Michael Pruitt, Weffy, Eric O'Sullivan, Rachel Acevedo Hoffman, Zach Neal, Mike Blanchard, Dr. Girlfriend, John Henry, Nick Gilbert, uh, my father, Carl Ward. Dr. Jerome Anderson, Antonio Lopez, Todd Stashwick, Hero's Journey Fitness, Scott the Therapist, Frank Muller, Mark Pepper, Emily Higgins, and Suara Sali. Thank you all very much for making these episodes possible. Uh, we are eternally grateful, uh, and we look forward to giving you all kinds of cool content coming up. Be sure to follow our family over at Fanbase Press. Until next time, I'm Brian Ward. I'm Dr. Drea Letamendi. And together we are... The Arkham Sessions.
what a reckoning sounds like.